if you're joining us for the first time again, there's Bert so let me just welcome you as well. My name is Richard, one of the uh, uh, pastors here as well. And it's great to have you here. If you're joining us for the first time, to all the regulars, it's good to see you. Great investment of your time on a Sunday morning. We're going to jump in, um, and uh, just for the sake of those who uh, haven't been around for the last few weeks, we're in a series called The Creed. Now, what is the creed? There's many creeds. The, the creed that we're looking at is uh, probably one of the most well-known ones. It's called the Apostles' Creed. And this really essentially is a summary, the earliest summary statement of what Christians believe. If you boil it down to what the fundamentals, there's more that Christians believe than the creed, but if you boil it down to what are the essentials of what Christians believe across the different uh, traditions from Orthodox, Catholic to Protestant, uh, it's summarized in what's called the creed. And we've been working our way through systematically uh, through the creed. They say there's 12 articles of the creed. In other words, there's 12 kind of key things that we want to lock in. And so we're in, I think, week eight, if I'm not mistaken, of the creed. And uh, throughout this series, we've been trying to uh, establish uh, what we believe, why it's important we believe that, and its implications for how we live our lives uh, today. And so the creed is, uh, it comes from the Latin word credo, and it's something I believe and I trust in. And it's a, it's a creed that's to be confessed. Now, if you grew up in a tradition like mine, we didn't really speak much about the, the Apostles' Creed. But uh, what we've been enjoying doing here the last few weeks in the Creed is, is actually standing together and reciting it. So I'm invite you to do that with me today. We could all just stand together and we're going to recite the Creed um, and affirm that we're in unity with the uh, body of Christ throughout the world. So here we go. It's up on the screen there for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can take your seats and let me pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can look to the past in order to establish us in the present and look hopefully towards the future. Lord, we know that we can never plumb the depths of all your truth has for us, but today we're asking God that you would let us hear only what we need to hear for today. And so we entrust that to you by your spirit. Would you work in our hearts today a planting your truth that it would bear fruit, much fruit, and fruit that would last and remain. For your glory, our joy, in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So a few weeks back, I want to put up an image that will probably mean very little to most of you here. Uh, if it means something to you, woohoo, let me know in the coffee bar. Uh, but a few weeks back, uh, this, um, this was the culmination of the Rugby World Cup that was played in Japan. I spent 30 years of my life in a country called South Africa. I wasn't born there, but I spent 30 years of my life in a country called South Africa. South Africa was in the finals, and they were playing England, which is where I was born. I lived for four years. So I had my England and my South African rugby jersey ready to go, depending on which way I went. I kid. I'm a full-on South African supporter. Coming into that final, England were favorites. They had beaten the, 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 the clear favorites in world rugby dominated by the New Zealand, the All Blacks. They had beaten them in the semifinals. And, and South Africa had really scraped through their game against Wales in the semifinals. So it was really thought that England were going to take this. And uh, not only did South Africa win, but they won dominantly, 32-12. Uh, and so um, the, the game took place at 5 a.m. in the morning our time. It's not what time they play rugby, it's just time zone differences. <laughs> And so we put our alarm clock on, and on a Saturday morning at some ungodly, well, is there any ungodly, at some ridiculous hour, let's not say it's ungodly, some ridiculous <laughs> hour to be awake on a Saturday morning, uh, Chantal and I were watching, and uh, we ended up waking up kids because we were so excited to scream. Um, and then we had to rush off to a soccer game. And, and so it was so great to be in that moment, but the one thing we realized is, like, there was no one really to celebrate and share our joy with. <laughs> it's not like we could have, you know, when the Raptors won, I don't know where you were watching, but we were watching at home, and we ran outside, and people were cheering in the streets and the condos and things. Had we done that at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning, 
no one's celebrating with us. Also, it didn't mean much to people. Even when I came here on Sunday, the next day, there were some people like, I think, just entertain. Oh, that's great. That's lovely. Wow, what's wrong with you? Until I did meet with uh, some of my fellow South Africans here, and we just shared something. Um, and um, that's a cool story. I just wanted to share that with you. But it actually is a bit of a segue into where we're going to today. And it, 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 made, it made me just realize, not realize, I think we see this all over, and I think if you were honest in your life, what makes life rich and meaningful really is the presence of people around you to share it with. If it's a movie that you watch, or a meal, and I know introverts are like, no me, I'm pretty good with me, myself, and I. But even introverts, as a fellow introvert, even us, sometimes we do, we need that sense of presence sense of shared experience with people. You watch something that's pretty cool and you want to tell someone, you experience a celebratory moment like that and you want to share it with others, share in their joy. It talks about the longings of our hearts. What, what else as we look into our hearts do we, do we long for? If we truly grab a moment in our busy lives and we sit down and we pay attention, well, we, we, we long for connection, right? We, we do, we long for connection. If it's if it's emphasized by digital platforms, or it's coffee one-on-one -on -one with a friend, or it's being far from family and, and pining for that, we long for connection, we long for relationship, we long for community, we long for justice. We talked about that last week. Lucas talked about that. There's something in the human heart when we see injustice, we cry out something with us and say, that's wrong, we need justice. Or if we experience injustice, something in our human hearts tells us we long for justice. And we could go on. We long for unity. We long for uh, selflessness in others. We long for people to put other people's needs before their own as we look to politicians or government or leadership, that kind of thing. And Christianity would say that's by design. Because you are made in the image and likeness of a God who is all about that. So what kind of God? You know, sometimes if you interact with people and they say, well, I don't really believe in God much. You, one of the great questions to ask them is, well, tell me about the God you don't believe in, because I might also not believe in that God. Because sometimes they'll say, well, I don't believe a God of the Bible because he's so angry and kills people and he just wants to wipe out and he hates homosexuals and that kind of thing. So, wow, well, we're a good come I don't believe in that God either. <laughs> and so the thing about Christianity is we're made in the image and likeness of God. What kind of God? Well, the God of the creed. The creed has been telling us about this God. And so if you pull out the creed again, you will see the creed is intentionally written in three stages. And the first line says, I believe in God. What kind of God? The Father. Second paragraph, what's the line there? It says, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. So we have God the Father, we have God the Son. And what's the third paragraph and where we're going to be kicking off today? I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now this is a crucial, fundamental, essential part of our belief system, and I don't think we've touched on it yet, and so I'm not going to spend the rest of this message talking about the Trinity, but I do want to highlight it. It's, it's fundamentally critical that we remember that we worship a God in Christianity that's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, this is unique to Christianity. It's what sets itself apart from other religions that would all claim to, uh, to a deity. And so we want to lean into that, we want to explore that, and obviously we don't have the time to go into all the depths of that. The thing about the Trinity is so very hard to get your finite mind around it, right? And that's the challenge sometimes, is when we don't understand things, when we don't really see it applicable to our lives, we kind of ignore it, but we do that to our peril. What the Trinity says, it, it affirms that God is one in essence, yet three in persons, distinct personalities of the Trinity. And so what we can sometimes do is overplay the oneness of God. And so we want to avoid that. It was a known heresy called modelism, which said that there's really one God, but he comes to us in three kind of modes, modelism modes. Sometimes he's like the Father, sometimes he's like the Son, but sometimes like the Spirit, but he's really one God. And so we reject that. The other side, we can go to three gods, tritheism. So it's God the Father, and there's three gods sitting up there, each having unique and different roles, and so we need to reject that too. And so we take one God in three persons. Figure that one out. Good luck to you. But some of the helpful pictures of the Trinity is the essence of that is God within himself is unity and diversity. And we see this play out all over life. Look at your, look at your human body. 
Look at your body right now. There is such diversity, such distinction of functions within your human body, your nervous system, to all the things you can't see, to the things in your extremities that you can see. Yet, hopefully, your body is united, right? Hopefully, your foot is not fighting your ear, you know? That would be pretty hard to sleep at night, that kind of thing. So we see it in things like the human body. We see it in a, a meal. Have you enjoyed a good meal recently? Typically, it's not just one ingredient, right? It's not just like two-minute noodles, although that's my go-to comfort food uh, these days. Like if you enjoy a good bowl of ramen, or you enjoy a good steak dinner with uh, the sides, what is it? It's this unity of a meal. We want ingredients that make sense together, yet are diverse in that. I think about a symphony. Um, think about the Toronto Symphony. Think about this. Think about how many different parts are incorporated into that symphony. And yet, as we appreciate good music, uh, that comes united together. And so we can look at that and we can see traces of the God of the Trinity are playing in all the society. And it's why you and I crave love, to be loved and to love. It's why you and I crave community, because we created in the one who's eternally love and eternally community within himself. Why is that so important to remember? It's because when God creates, he's not creating out of any need. He doesn't need us. He's not fulfilling some need to create because he's a creator. He is a creator, but that's not his first identity. He's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so what he's doing in creation is like say, guys, let's make the circle bigger. Let's let others enjoy this love and community and fellowship relationship that we have. And that is in essence what drives God to do what he does. And so we even see a distinctiveness in how they operate. Now they're all co-equal as God, but they have unique distinct roles. Often it's been said as a pattern that the Father initiates from the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. And the creed, if you pull the creed up again, you'll see that the Father initiates creation and redemption, the Son accomplishes redemption, and then the Spirit applies the work of the Son to us and redemption. So if you go to the creed, you'll see what follows from here in the rest of the creed and the rest of the few weeks that we're going to see. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And because of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit births a new humanity. We call it the church. Because of the forgiveness of sins of what Jesus has done, the Spirit takes and applies that to our relationship. You can enter into a renewed relationship with God. That's what you were created for. Sin disrupted that. Jesus accomplished, removed that. And the Spirit now applies that and lets you have a daily intimate relationship with God. And then ultimately, as you see the resurrection of our bodies in the likeness of Jesus, and as we see the life of the lasting and new heaven and new earth, the Spirit is about not just creating, but recreating with God the Father and God the Son. So some of the challenges, I think, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and that's where we're going to park and spend the rest of the time now. So we just touched a little bit on the Trinity there. Hopefully that sparked your interest. You got you more confused. Fantastic. Did my job. Thank you. Let's move on. The Holy Spirit. Now, this is an easy one, right? <laughs> The challenge with the Holy Spirit is I think we have some reference to God as Father, right? Typically, we have a Father, or even if we didn't have a Father, we know what fathers are. Um, we know what sons are. But Holy Spirit, sometimes Holy Spirit is called the Holy Ghost. I don't know if that's such, such a helpful way to describe Him. Because as we're going to see, He's not an impersonal force or energy. He's a person, the third person of the Trinity. He has personality. We can lie to the Holy Spirit. We can breathe the Holy Spirit. He can speak to us. He can teach us. He can guide us. That's all talk of a personality, not an impersonal force. And so what we want to do today is we don't just want to confess a belief in the Holy Spirit. We want that to be experienced in our day to day life, right? This creed is not helpful if we just memorize it. By the way, there is a test coming. Did you know that? Did you mention that? That you will need to pass that before you're allowed to go into 2020. Um, but it's not just that we memorize it, and it's good to memorize. It's part of catechism. It's good to memorize these things, the essential beliefs. But if it's not translating into somehow impacting your life, then we're losing the power of it. And the same thing with the Holy Spirit. God forbid that we would speak for 30 minutes on the Holy Spirit, but leave here with real more um, understanding and awareness and greater hunger for His operation in our lives. And so it's kind of my goal today to help us just not just confess, and, but experience the reality and see Him at play in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, my story is, uh, in terms of a church, um, is I've experienced um, kind of the two spectrums of when we talk about the Holy Spirit. So in Christianity, we talk about the Reformed traditions, you know, Prot uh, Prot the Protestant Reformed traditions, you know, would be um, Presbyterian churches, Reformed churches, and so 
they have a very high value. So when I was growing up, one of my first church experiences was my parent, my mom, uh, dad were worshipped at a um, at Church of England, which is an offshoot of an Anglican tradition. Okay, so it's not high Anglicanism, but still enough of the liturgy, and they have an immensely high value of scripture. Incredibly high value of scripture. And so sometimes people will look at it and kind of jokingly point and say, Yeah, they believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. Because they have such a strong grounding in scripture. They believe God speaks to us primarily through his word. But in sometimes in so doing they can perhaps downplay the role of the Holy Spirit. And so in some expressions of it we call it cessationism. The Holy Spirit doesn't really operate in our day-to-day -day lives as you see in the book of Acts. That was just for that time, and it ceased. Cessation, it ceased with the apostles. It was just really used for the birth of the church. Then as I grew up, I, I, I got to experience, um, on the other side of the spirit, is what call a charismatic or Pentecostal church. Anyone from a charismatic Pentecostal background, right? Oh my goodness. Now they go to the other extreme sometimes, and it's all about the spirit. It's all about the word of the Lord right now. Never mind that God's also communicated and written down His Word for us. And it can get weird. It can get creepy. You know, in, in my only reference, when we were praying about what was next for us back in Cape Town, my, and, and, and Toronto, my only reference to Toronto was what was called the Toronto Blessing. If you don't know what that is, in the, the mid-90s there was an, an awakening and an outpouring of God's Spirit that happened here, which is awesome. It did amazing things, but it also had a weirdness to it. And uh, that turned a lot of people off people barking and acting like a chicken. And, and so the charismatics would say, hey man, that's when God, you just can't box God. Now, absolutely, you cannot box God. Absolutely. And so, so growing up, and, and so for me, as I look back in my life, there was a time when, um, when, when I came into my college years, my university years, I really began to despise actually my, my parents. And I'm going to be careful here because my dad loves to watch so a little shout out to my dad if he's watching right now and I hope I don't get a phone call later. It's like, I'm still your dad. <laughs> but to be, to be honest, I, sometimes I despise them and I despise their lack of the Holy Spirit because I was in this charismatic church and God was doing amazing things on campus and we spoke in tongues and had 24-7 prayer meetings and it just seemed like God was doing amazing things with us and, and what's happening in your life over there, right? <laughs> um, and then as I grew through the charismatic church and saw some of the, the dysfunction of the charismatic church, the overplay and the power and just a lack of character in a lot of the leaders and resulted in sometimes a lot of leaders living double lives. And, and a lot of people got hurt by the charismatic church, the abuse of those kind of things. And so, so kind of the pendulum swung the other way. I'm like, man, this is my tribe, but I hate this tribe. <laughs> I don't want to be associated with the tribe. You know, when we came to Toronto, we, we wanted to try and bring an expression of Christianity that avoided just the over extremeness of charismatic, but at the same time still fundamentally believing that the Spirit is alive and well today, and gosh, do we need His power in and through our lives. And so, hopefully, I don't think we ever balance it right, but there's a tension there of character and charisma. Um, of fruit and gifts, and that we do a disservice when we abandon one or the other. And so let's have a look at that today. What do we believe about the Holy Spirit and why does it matter? In order to do that, let's start at a very critical point in history. It's Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. This is a fundamental uh, part of our history in the story of God, and um, it's going to serve us well today. Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 to 4, um, Sheila referenced this a couple of weeks ago, so to get you up to speed, uh, uh, Jesus has, uh, has been resurrected from the dead, and he's spending about 40 days with his disciples before his ascension, and, um, and he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send you the ongoing, but it's really good that I'm going, because if I don't go, you don't get to see the Holy Spirit, you're going to experience him, he's going to be with you, I mean, what an endorsement by Jesus of the Holy Spirit, and how good is the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, let's get it, we get out of here. I'm going to send them to you. So we catch up with them as they're, uh, as they're waiting. And Pentecost, it was a, a historic in the Jewish calendar. It was 50 days after the Passover. And it was a celebration. It was a celebration of the first fruits. Now, there's nothing by chance, I think, in Scripture. So remember this. So it's a historical. So it's a typical Jewish. They're gathered in Jerusalem. People come from all over. And they're about to celebrate the first fruits of the harvest. And it also meant just a celebration of God renewing His covenant with His people. So remember that as... As we see the Spirit be poured out. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we're going to leave it there for now. To understand the significance of this moment, we kind of have to zoom out a little bit. I want to go back all the way to creation. We are introduced to God the Holy Spirit in the second verse of Genesis chapter 1. and tells us that the Holy Spirit was hovering over this form and void, the darkness, that God had put some raw materials into creation, but not yet had begun to pull forth that out. And so we see the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful word. He's hovering. Uh, in other translations, it says it's kind of like a mother hen brooding over her her um, eggs, it's kind of like it's got this energy, this force. Now that word spirit in the Old Testament, it's this Hebrew word rach, you're going to get a little bit like, like you're about to spit, right? That's the word, and, it, and it's translated it's a breath or wind as well. And in the New Testament, it's pneuma. Uh, and it's this idea of what, what's breath and what's wind, well, it's a power of life-giving force um, that we, we see its effect by but we don't necessarily see it, but we see its effect. You think of wind. We, we, we can't see wind, but gosh, you can see the effects of wind, right? Sometimes devastatingly so in hurricanes and, and things like that. And this is the idea that we get that God's Spirit is powerful, waiting for God the Father to use His Word. And as He speaks, the Spirit brings life to that Word. So that's in creation. Then throughout the Old Testament, God's presence is uninhibited, at least for the first couple of chapters of Genesis. God's Spirit, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, fellowship, unhindered with mankind until we see the tragedy of the fall. And the rest is history from there. We see God doesn't remove entirely, but very clear restrictions come on His manifest presence. So throughout the Old Testament, God God is everywhere, but when we talk about God manifesting His presence, it's a real intimate, powerful manifestation. And it was so powerful, God so holy, that he had to be contained in tabernacles and tents. And ultimately, they built the temple. And only very specific people, the priests, could go in once a year and make atonement. And so, throughout the, the Old Testament, we see God's Spirit come on very specific people with very specific tasks. Think of Joseph. The Spirit gives him an ability to interpret dreams, and that really helps him. And not just him, the nation of Israel. God really comes on and helps we see a guy called Bezalel, and he's an artisan. He's a creative guy. He does amazing things with his hands, and God the Spirit comes in and empowers him in his creativity and his gifting to make beautiful things in the temple. And throughout Old Testament, you'll see that. But it's not everyone. Specific people, specific tasks. The greatest people that you see this with is the prophets. God chooses and selects and anoints prophets and, and women, prophetesses, to really see things from God's perspective and speak it forth. They're, they have an ability, God's Spirit has an ability to help them understand from God's perspective, not just what's going around, but how God is seeing what's happening in history, and then to be able to speak that and call forth that. In fact, uh, one Old Testament prophet, Ezekiel, um, prophesied and saw and said, God is going to revisit us again with His presence, like He did in Genesis. And it's going to be very different. He's going to come again in the fullness of His Spirit. And in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, God speaking, he says, I will give you a new heart, speaking to his people. See, our problem is not just we do wrong things. It's fundamentally that our hearts have been turned away from loving God. And that births a whole lot of wrong stuff. And so God is not just trying to clean up our behavior. He's going to the driver of that behavior, and it's a heart that's turned away from him. And so look what he says he's going to do through, um, through the prophet Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. There's going to be a tenderness there. And I will put my spirit, my breath, my wind, my life-giving force, the Holy Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And so they had this anticipation. And we see other prophets say there's going to be a day where God's going to put His Spirit in all flesh. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will have visions. There's this anticipation building that they're looking to the future. If God's going to do something that's really going to change things. Into Jesus. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. In fact, we see Jesus, in, he's about 30 years old. 
And he goes to John the Baptist and he wants to get baptized. And there's an amazing moment where John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus. And as he comes out of the water in Matthew 3, we see actually a, quite a clear picture of the, the, the Trinity. We see God the Son coming out of the water and God the Father and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And out of heaven we see this is my Son and whom I well pleased. God shows his pleasure on his Son through giving the Holy Spirit. Remember that. Right? Because it's not just unique to Jesus. Which brings us to, uh, well, before it brings us to, to Pentecost. Jesus, from that moment, is empowered by the Spirit. Now, we look at Jesus like we said he was God. Now, we covered this way back, so you have to go catch it up. But everything that Jesus did on this earth, he did it in his capacity as a human, not with the effects of sin that we have, for sure, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's healing, so he's demonstrating, he's proclaiming through the power of the Holy Spirit that's upon him. The Holy Spirit enables him. And so he goes to the, the cross, he dies and he's resurrected. And you've got to think, I don't know if this is not in scripture, but you've got to think, you've got to think what's the Holy Spirit doing while Jesus is laying there on Saturday in the tomb. His lifeless body, Jesus' lifeless body. i got to think the Holy Spirit is hovering over him, waiting for the Father to give the word, let there be life. Through a day, he rises from a day, great game changer. And the Spirit does that over our hearts. He has to give us a new heart. He hovers over us, working on us, and he's waiting for the Father's word to let there be life in Richard. Boom. He's resurrected. So, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, Jesus, he comes alive again. <laughs> he's resurrected from the dead. And he tells his disciples about this moment in Acts 1, verse 4 to 5. While staying with them, Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be, with, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and even the ends of the earth, which brings us to Pentecost. So all that's important to know what's going on now here at Pentecost. So Pentecost really is the outpouring of the Spirit and does three things for us. One, it's the, it's the fulfillment of these Old Testament hopes of God's presence returning to us in a greater way. Not just for a select few, but for all people. That we can access God somehow, the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it's the culmination of Christ's earthly work. It's one of the last things that Jesus does for us. In his earthly work, now he continues to work. We heard that Rashida speaking, what he continues to do, but he sends us the Holy Spirit in one of his last acts of his earthly work. And then it's the inauguration of this new dispensation. You know, we're in the end times, so to speak, and it's the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of God's new creation that he's working towards that we are to have hope for and we're to long for. And how are we to know that? Well, one of the guaranteed deposits of that is God sending His Holy Spirit, pouring it out on all people. And this happens at Pentecost. And they know this. They understand that Jewish men and Jewish women, they, they were immersed in this story. And they're re, it's reinterpreted for them because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So in short, as we begin to wrap this up, in short, who is the Holy Spirit? We believe the Holy Spirit is God's personal you know, the impersonal force, but personal and empowering presence with us. That's at work on us, in us, and through us. Let's look at that very quickly, and then we're going to end and respond to him today. So the Spirit, one of the great roles of the Holy Spirit <coughs> is to glorify Jesus, is to reveal Jesus, is to point people to Jesus. Jesus talked about that often. He says the Spirit, the, the helper, the comforter, when he comes, he's going to remind you of all that I've said to you. He's going to draw you to me. And so this is what the Spirit does. Firstly, He works on us. The Spirit reveals and glorifies Jesus to us by working on us. No one can come to God the Father. No one can know God unless they're born again. Unless they're uh, recreated, regenerated. And this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Through different things, He convicts us. He converts us. He regenerates us. Jesus has an interaction with Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. And He talks about this. And you can see Nicodemus, like, Jesus said, hey, you've got to be born again. It's so bad that you've got to have a fresh start in life. And Nicodemus is like, yeah, I'm an old man. Like, how do I go back to my mom's? Like, like this is a thing that you skip, you skip biology classes, Jesus. Like, this doesn't work in the natural. And he's like, no, no, I'm not talking about the natural, but there's something significantly deeper. You're a spiritual being, and you're dead right now. 
but through the life and power of the Spirit, you can come alive. And so we all need to be born again. And so this is what the Spirit does. John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Spirit is all about bearing witness. It's a beautiful thing. The Spirit always tries to point people to Jesus. And what's Jesus doing? He's telling you, hey, have you met my Father? Can I introduce you to the Father? And then what's the Father doing? Have you met my Son? And so it's a beautiful thing. They're, they're all in agreement together. They have distinct roles for sure, but there's a unity there. There's a humility there. There's a, there's a glorifying and a, and a deferring one to another there. What is one of the applications of that is, well, one, do you know some people who aren't Christians and, and you're burdened by that? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a work colleague. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a, a, a child, a, a parent, whatever. It is people. So if God really uses, if, if God really uses, if people really need to be awakened to Jesus by His Spirit, we can pray in line with that. We can ask the Spirit to be at work in people's lives. Despite what you and I, sometimes we're afraid or sometimes we're inhibited to, to speak to people about Jesus because we feel like we don't know enough or doesn't come out right. And that's not to negate those things. We should know our stuff well. We should be able to be able to share what we believe and have a hope for us in an intelligent, uh, engaging way. But let's never put our full faith in that. Despite that, God can still, God by the Holy Spirit is one bearing witness to Jesus. And so the application of that is we can pray and we can have confidence in moving towards others who don't know Jesus. Secondly, He not just works on us, He's worked in us. The Holy Spirit isn't just with us. The promise of Pentecost is that He would come within you. He would reside within you. Now, there's some debate in Christianity as to when exactly, uh, you know, do, do you get the gift of the Holy Spirit in the Reformed camp over here? They would say, well, like conversion, right? You need the Holy Spirit to be born again, so absolutely get conversion, and you don't get like a half measure of the Holy Spirit. Get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So a conversion. You, if you're a Christian born again, you're filled with the Spirit. And the charismatic will so say, well, actually, there's a, a subsequent baptism that we see that is needed. And so we need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit's power. And I think there's a third way that says yes and yes. I think absolutely, fundamentally, the Holy Spirit comes to you in conversion. He's the one who regenerates you. You get the Holy Spirit there. But there's also... Not just a one-off with the Charismatics and Pentecostals will sometimes say, just a once-off baptism. Scripture te- speaks about Ephesians 5, speaks about continuously being filled by the Spirit. Not just a one-off. That there are touches throughout our lives where we can experience the Spirit's power and filling in greater measures. And so he reflects, uh, the Spirit of God is, is coming within us to reflect Jesus in us. He's, he's working in us to make us more like Jesus by filling us. You think about uh, a boat that has a sail. What the, what the Spirit does is He energizes at that boat. We can have amazing sails, but if it's a windless day, it's not going to go anywhere. And sometimes, and this is a great picture of our work and the Spirit's work. Like if we don't have our sail up, it doesn't matter how much that's, that wind blows. Okay? And sometimes that's what sometimes that's what my beautiful tribe of the Pentecostal Charismatics here is. They don't really pay attention to Bible reading plans or... There's no kind of, the Holy Spirit is all about spontaneity, which is ridiculous if you think about the order. That, but, you know, it's all about, we, know, we don't make plans, we just, we just move by the Spirit as if that's spiritual. And so they've got a boat, but don't pay much attention to the sail getting up there often. Or as a lot of people often predict, if the Holy Spirit is a fire, the Reformed are good at building fireplaces, but don't really have any fire. The, host, the, the Pentecostal Charismatics, they have fire, but it burns the house down. They never put it within a fireplace. And so we don't want either or. And so what we want is we want to build a boat. We want to cast our sail. We want to put ourselves in the places of God meeting with us, all the while recognizing, gosh, God, unless you blow on this sail, I'm not going to go anywhere in life. And so I can read my Bible. I can pray. I can be diligent in giving one. And I do that trusting that you're the one going to energize that and empower that and take that far beyond what I could do in my own way. And so the great pictures of the New Testament are being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. And the result of that is what's called the fruit of the Spirit. 
Galatians speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. As the Spirit resides in you, as you allow Him to fill your cell, as you walk with Him, as you make steps of progress with Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit should be ever in ours. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. They should become more and more evident in our lives. And then lastly, the Spirit doesn't just want to work on us or in us, but He wants to work through us. That He empowers us and gifts His body so that the ministry and the message of Jesus can keep going forward until Jesus returns. Until He returns. Uh, Hebrews 2, verse 3 to 4, says it like this. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Now, we don't have the time to go on what those gifts are. We don't have the time to, you know, maybe at a future stage we should do that. Probably we should. But just know this, that the Holy Spirit is not just in you, making, producing the life of Jesus within you, but He wants to work through you. He wants to empower you to have fruit. He wants to empower you to be a witness to Jesus and His kingdom through word, deed, and science. Now, I was thinking about what, what personal story could I share reflect this and there's many stories where God's used me to I've seen that but I want to use a, a flip it around and, and share a story a really personal story for us that's been tremendously impactful of how God's spirit has ministered to us through signs and wonders and so excuse the, the graininess of this picture but it's actually a screen grab of a much younger Richard you know, pretty much the same Chantal I think. <laughs> so what's going on here let me set this up as quickly as I can but this is, this is 6th of May, 2007. We're back in Cape Town. We're being ordained as pastors in our church there, our Ignatian church there. For some of you who recognize the gentleman on the left is uh, Pastor Jim Lafoon, who's a well-recognized prophet in our movement. And then that was my pastor at the time, Gareth Stead, who's leading that congregation. And we've been prayed for. We've been prayed. And you know, what's cool about this is my um, non-charismatic parents are sitting in that audience. About 2,000 people there. We had a church of about 2,000 people there. And, uh, you know, it, it, they would come a couple of times... Uh, to and it's, it's without fail. I say, hey, mom and dad, come, and, and you're just praying. God, please don't let them sit next to that wild person, you know, the person. And every time they'll be next to the person who frothes at the mouth, sings in tongues, and just uh, you know, as a tambourine going or whatever. And it's like, oh. So they're there. They're there, obviously, to support us. Um, and so Jim Lafine's doing his thing. He's praying and he's prophesying. He's actually prophesying part of why we're here today. And then he changes and he begins to speak of a Chantal. And he says, I'm praying for you right now. That God's touching your hormonal system right now. And what he didn't know, that only we knew, and my parents knew in that room, was about a month ago, we'd been told by our doctors it was going to become very difficult if near impossible for us to fall pregnant. It's because of some of the stuff going on in Chantal's hormonal system. So he said, it, it, when the time comes you want to start a family, you're going to need maybe some uh, treatment, a life treatment. And so that was pretty hard news for us. We I mean, didn't share it with anyone else but our parents and my parents were there and he starts prophesying he starts speaking he says god is going to come and right now god's touching your hormonal system in fact there's been a generational thing and blah, blah, blah. and this is right now may 6th of may 2007 rachel was born april 29 2008 and so what was amazing about that is when we brought rachel to church for the first time as an infant as a baby the amount of people came and said, I was there that Sunday. I was there that Sunday when Pastor Jim prayed for you. And so we would say he got a word of knowledge, a gift of faith. And in that moment, I don't know how God did it, whether it was right that moment or over a few, doesn't matter. We're just the recipient of that, where God's power broke through in the natural and not just ministered to us, but many other people there. I mean, even when Rachel was turning one and 18 months later, people were still coming out of I was there that Sunday and encouraged them. And so that's what is now. I hesitated to use that story because it's, it's, it always seems that the Spirit does the dramatic. It does the spectacular. I mean, it's pretty spectacular. And yes, He does the dramatic. He does the spectacular. And we need the dramatic and the spectacular. You need it in your life. We need it in this church. We need it in this city. Can we agree upon that? That's not only what he does. That same spirit was at work with us. We went to lunch with my parents. Here's the end of that story. 
my parents are wide-eyed. How did he know that? Not in a cynical way, in a, like, like, this is amazing. It's messing with my frame of reference right now, but this is incredible. And the same Holy Spirit that was with met us on Monday morning as we read our Bibles, the same Holy Spirit resides with us today. You can't know God. You can't be in fellowship with God without the Holy Spirit. Yes, He shows up in the dramatic. Gosh, God, do we want you to move in the dramatic, the spectacular, miraculous signs, wonders, and power? But we'll also not negate the day-to-day -day walking in the Spirit, being filled in the Spirit, and producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all that thing. I love this quote from Gordon Fees, written some great stuff about the Holy Spirit. Uh, quite like the Reformed Charismatic view world when it if the church is going to be effective in our postmodern world, we need to stop paying mere lip service to the Spirit to recapture the Spirit as the experienced, empowering return of God's personal presence in and among us, who enables us to live as a radically eschatological, it's just a future, people in the present world. And so I want to invite you to stand. And uh, I've asked the band, we're going we're gonna to sing a song. All right, well, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. I thought it would be a fitting way just to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. This is another song in our worldwide Every Nation movement. It's called Make Room. Make Room. We make room for your spirit. We make room for you to move. And as I end here, this is the posture I want to send us off with this week. Not just this week. I'm going, but if you want to see more of the Holy Spirit at work in your life, I want to see more of the Holy Spirit. It starts with the hunger. God comes where He's wanted. That's revival throughout history. If you look at the God comes where He's really wanted. And honestly, if I honestly ask myself, if you honest, do I really want God? There's been times I've said yes, and I can see God moving on. And there's times I'm like, ah, it's kind of a nice idea, but I'm really so busy with all these other things. So it's hunger. Two, it's attentiveness. It's an awareness. Being aware that He's with you every day. Yes in the spectacular, and yes in the mundane. In your cubicle at work, at the lecture on campus, at your family dinner table, wherever it is, be aware that the Spirit is with you, on you, in you, working through you. Allow yourself, make room for Him to move. And then the third thing is we activate. Step out, start trusting God to use you by His Spirit. And maybe in your small groups you can figure out ways in which God is, maybe you can share experiences of how God has done that. We're out of time for all that. There's so many great, amazing ways that God does, whether it's praying for someone or just being reminded of someone, or getting a verse for someone, or sharing an encouraging word for someone, or praying for them and they get healed. It, it all shapes and sizes. But we're going to sing this song, um, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And let it be a song, not just of collectively you're welcome in this church, which hopefully he is, but in your life, make room for him. And uh, as we respond in song, there's also another way that you can respond. And there's four ways, we have a response card, a white card that we use here. Um, and if you feel that the Spirit is drawing you to Jesus and you want to become a follower of Jesus, there's ways that we're going to help you do that. If, if there's other ways you want, you feel like the Spirit is wanting you to connect deeper into community, we want to help you do that. Or put your gifts in action by service. But let's, let's respond. We'd be amiss to be speaking about the Holy Spirit all this time and, and not respond to Him in some way, personally, allow Him to do what He does best. Let's do that. Mm -hmm.